start flying. I'm 62 years old, and I own a friggin' dinosaur park. Dinosaur Kingdom 2 is, uh, it's, it's a dinosaur park, but the most unusual dinosaur park in the world, because it's the only, the only dinosaur park where you get, the, hold on a second, Thurman, I'm talking. It's the only dinosaur park in the world where you get, down, down, by, you get to feed dinosaurs. I mean, Universal Studios doesn't even have that. Plus, you get to marry one. So basically what I did is I mixed <clears throat> two pieces of history, uh, recent history and ancient history. People love the Civil War history and they love dinosaurs. So I mixed them together and came up with my own storyline. So as it turns out, the Yankees were using dinosaurs as weapons of mass destruction against the South. It didn't work out too well for them. Since the victors write the history, See, they were embarrassed, so they left it out. But I tell here, I tell the story of what really happened. Very rare to come back. They were, they were, found, they were, they were cryogenically frozen in the Nathbridge Caverns, and there was an earthquake. And that this earthquake sort of shook things to where these dinosaurs were able to escape. But the dinosaurs, they didn't really know the difference between a blue uniform and a gray uniform. You see what I'm saying? So, I mean, everything looked like food to them. So it's really, really hard. It's like a curtain, curtain cap. So, just, just, just. so they abandoned that project. Stonewall Jackson was trying to, uh, they gave him a mechanical arm to try to help, you know, fight the climbing dinosaurs. Um, that didn't work out too well. It was, the whole thing was just a disaster. Lincoln didn't think much of it either. Did you say your uh, name real quick? Shane Biggs. Ooh, okay. okay. Uh, man of mystery. <laughs> <laughs> Many talents, actually, but uh, uh, credit. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when did you start working here? That's a tough question to answer because I've known them since this place was started. Oh. I used to have a uh, computer business, and I started by helping them with computer questions. And then I was working on their daughter's computers. And then they would bring me these weird questions. And then Mark would say, uh, hey man, can you make this do this? I want it to do this. And I'm like, well, I figured it out. Okay. So this was the first dinosaur park that I designed. And I was probably, gosh, I don't know, six or seven years old. And it was the Haunted Monster Museum. And uh, that's when I started working with them more see the Demetrodon here and he's got the snake wrapped around the tree. It was an old abandoned house that they turned into a haunted house. It got so big that there was a huge line to get into the haunted house. So they had a show, a theatrical show, for the people that were waiting to go through the house. This guy, he's I guess a brontosaurus and he's, he's eating some of the vegetation. And he would go on stage and he used the old guillotine trick to cut off his own head. Oh, there's a spear. I just noticed the spear is through this one. There was actually a giant chicken there if you chickened out, and it was called the chicken out. This one right here, well, he's up in the cave. He thinks he's pretty safe, but then there's a giant bird here. So there's something going on in this drawing. And at first glance, it's just a kid's drawing, but you can, when you really decipher it, you can tell what was going on in the young artist's mind. And then a year or two later, uh, they had a fire and uh, it burned up and it was sucked. And then that's when the inception of this place started. Oh my gosh. Why didn't they see this when I was little? Put this kid on medication. So I'll come up with these ideas. I'm not, you know, a technical guy at all. He'll 
go home at night and draw some comics and then think about that design. I want to come up with something unique that nobody has, has ever done before, not even Universal Studios. Something that's, that uh, when people come here, they walk away with the wow factor. So one of the things is, of course, you have a dinosaur park. You, I, I don't know of any place where you get to feed the dinosaurs. So we kind of kicked around ideas on well, how can we produce this. So I went with the, the, the Jaws mentality. You know, when Jaws came out, they had problems with a mechanical shark. So a lot of it was just the imagination because you, you're not going to see down into the ocean anyway, but you knew it was there. So I said, why don't we do this? Why don't we have where you, you push the button, the food comes in, the pig comes in, and can we create it so that once it goes into a silo, you hear the noise that's being eaten, and then it spits out the bones on the other side. So we worked along those, those parameters. I think it's better in some way because it's, 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 the, it's theatrically done. There are different cheesy aspects where you can walk through and it's a static scene. And you look at it, but if you want to see how that scene happened, you scan a QR code and a YouTube video comes up of him playing the part of how it happened. What was funny is when the day we went out to film these scenes, I had to rehearse, I had to show these guys what I wanted them to do. And they would do it and I said, no, no, this, no guys, you need to put more in here. here. And I went out and did it and the guy filmed me and uh, the guy said, oh, Mark, that was perfect. And I said, it was? Yeah. Okay, well, you guys are all fired. I'll do all the videos then. One of them, I'm using a GoPro and a monkey's arm. And when I was filming, I accidentally stepped in bees. Because the whole concept was a gorilla had stolen his clothes and I'll go to climb up a tree. But as I'm holding his clothes and filming, I step in a beehive and then I'm actually racing up the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> hey, give me them pants, you furry bummer. Hey, hey. <laughs> Mr. Slime is a very neutral kind of character. He's very comical. He doesn't really have that much of a personality. I mean, he's slime, for God's sake, but he's lovable. So I came from what was like a, the Rat Fink era and uh, slime creatures and uh, you know the big teeth and the, and the eyes that pop out. It was just that was just our thing. He pulled slime out of his butt to use the paint whip. Obviously, I'm going to call him Van Goo. Well, you might as well call him Van Goo. <laughs> <laughs> there was a program a local TV show called Slime Theater came out of Charlottesville. It was like one of these late night horror shows that would show like come on at 11 or midnight. Everybody tuned into it. They showed some of the worst horror movies ever, but everybody loved it. And the host would come out every now and again and he would talk about the show. Well, I sent them some artwork and they were like, wow, look at this artwork. And they found that I was 13 years old. So they they had me on the show. So I was kind of a TV star in junior high school. Mr. Slime was their logo, but after the show, of course, was over, I still drew Mr. Slime. I didn't come up with him, but he sort of attached to me and stayed with me over the years. When people walk through and they see Mr. Slime, and they push buttons and there he comes through the wall and he appears in a, in a window or whatever, I, I think at first people are kind of wondering what that has to do with anything. I guess they're used to the old-fashioned kind of dinosaur parks where they just kind of stand there. There might be a plaque telling people what they are and what they do. But uh, I kind of like that when people walk in and they're not quite sure what to expect and they leave with a kind of inspiration. And it's like, oh, this is more than we thought it was going to be. Oh, oh we, we, were, we were able to be kids again. We were able to fight with Bigfoot. We didn't know none of this was, was going to happen for us. Boys and girls, the Bigfoot Shootout Show will begin in five minutes. So come on down to the Truth or Dare Theater and fill up your water servers. And remember, Bigfoot and all no other animals were harmed in the production of this show. Just the humans. I do the daily Bigfoot shootout show at Dinosaur Kingdom 2.
when we first opened the park and we realized when people were walking through it, it, it can get hot. So I just simply put up a sprinkler. And well, you couldn't keep the kids out of it. So I'm like, hmm, hmm, maybe I can wrap a show around this. The parents sometimes get a lot more involved than the kids. Or the kids will get scared and they'll sit out. I've had shows where I do just like one-on-one -on -one with the parent. They love it. Oh, I love doing the shootout, yeah. You know, for me, it's not just, oh, well, let me create this and see how much money I can put in my pocket. Um, if I see kids out there playing, I mean, I, this it gives me an excuse to get out there and play with kids without seeming like a like a big weirdo. This has got small guns. That's what they put like classical music. Not me. Yeah. Yeah. Very cultured Virginia. I've got um, two daughters and they're grown, and I just I love being a dad. Um, don't have any grandchildren, so. This is kind of the next best thing for now. If you had problems like me, I was very socially anxious. I was afraid to even come to places like this. When you're forced to go out there and interact with people, it really opens you up to more possibilities. It's an amazing experience all around. Kingdom 2 on this Labor Day weekend. I'm Mark. I created the park if you like it. If not, well, I'll just work here. <laughs> so, uh, we got two rules here. Number one is uh, have fun, and the second rule is try not to get eaten. Thank you very much. Now I have a friend that's in his mid-70s and he owns a big restaurant. Behind his restaurant, he's got a tree house that's so big, he ran out of tree. So he was building six by six posts going up to hold out other pieces of the building going up. And I told him, I said, Walt, I hope you never get this finished. And he went, what? I said, I hope you never finish this tree house. He went, what's that supposed to mean? I said, well, if you finish this tree house, then what are you gonna do? When he got to thinking about it, he went, yeah, yeah, that's, you're right. I'll go on my, de on my deathbed, I'll, I'll have thousands of pieces out there that are done, some that are in mid, hopefully, that are, in, in, that are, that are not quite finished. Because, you know, Walt Disney, you know, he, he, was, he died in 1966, and he would have never dreamed his business would have gotten as big as it did. But he kept, he had lots of things on the burner when he passed away. They weren't finished. And that's okay. That's all right. Um, it's, it's sort of a liberating feeling, too, to know that you can say that because ultimately, ultimately, none of us really own anything. We don't. So we just use it. We use it as much as we can. We do the best we can with it, and then we just have to set it aside. how to make the mold of my hand and make duplicates. I thought, well, I'll go down to Virginia Beach and open up this monster museum. I'll talk about haunted house kind of thing. Well, I went down there and scouted it out. They didn't have any kind of thing like that down there. So I thought I was going to really set the world on fire. It, it, it all felt, it was a disaster. You talk about being scared. Here I was 
thinking that I was gonna marry my girlfriend, we were gonna, I was gonna open up a big business, we were gonna make millions of dollars, and success was just gonna drip off of me. Well, that wasn't the case. I had to come back here with my tail between my legs. So there's a lot of scary moments. I took a lot of chances. We were coming back. The radiator broke down in Mechanicsville, and I'm thinking, all right, you know, icing on the cake. We were walking down the street and saw uh, this palm readist sign outside of this residence. And so we thought, well, okay, let's go in and check this out. He had a $5 reading and a $10 reading. And I felt like the kid with the magic beans coming back with the magic. I mean, it's like, okay, I got $5 in my pocket. I could get something to eat. This is all I have. She read my palm and she said, something didn't work out for you. She said, some kind of business venture. She said, you're very upset. She said, but stick with your dreams and things will come true for you bigger than you could ever expect. I don't believe in all this stuff about the palm readist, but she's right. I shouldn't give up. I shouldn't give up. And I was at a point where really, I mean, if, if there was a moment to give up. That was when the moment was. But no, I, I stuck with it. And uh, when I got back, just so happened to be the year that they also opened up the World's Fair in Knoxville. I proposed to my girlfriend, we got married. I thought, great, I'm a success. Well, the next year we didn't have any World's Fair and it was a struggle. I lost, I lost my wife over, over a lot of this because over the struggles, her parents were telling her that Mark will never amount to anything, that I was too much of a dreamer. And here I married their daughter and she had to compete with her parents, and so I lost her. We loved each other very much, but she took off, and, uh, and it was all mine. psychiatrist at least two or three times a year and I talked to him a couple days ago about about when do I need to start thinking about suicide well if I start getting Lou Gehrig's disease or if I start being at the point where I'm not doing what I'm doing now and I can't be useful anymore I said right now I'm in my right mind it's not like oh I had a breakup with my girlfriend or um, you know this guy pissed me off and, and, and uh, I'm, I can't do this anymore or whatever and I'm just going to show those that I'm going to show her or whatever. You know, they've got suicide prevention lines and all for that. I encourage it to anybody that that is has gotten to a, a certain plateau in their lives and they they know it's they, they they can't they can't go forward. They can't go forward with it. And if it gets to the, the point where they feel like they they're, they're not useful that they can't that they can't help people anymore through their gifts then it's time, it's, there's a time to go there's a time to go there's a, there's a, a passage in the Bible about it um, Ecclesiastes I guess it is they made a song out of it to everything, to, to everything for everything there's a, uh, there's a season and there's a time for, there's a purpose for everything under heaven it goes like that something like that so when it's my time Unless I go quickly and I'm still in the middle of everything, then I wanted to make sure that when I talk to my psychiatrist about it, because again, crazy people don't know they're crazy. So I want to make sure this, is this unhealthy for me to even think this? Is it? Is it? Well, he says it's not. And as I've sketched the concept, my altered, my change. Those ideas just keep coming. It's almost a blessing and a curse. I was just telling somebody last night that it was... I just don't turn, I can't turn it off. And it's, it's, uh, if I never went to bed, it would be 24-7. It just never, it never stops. It just never stops. I can't put it down fast enough. I can't build this stuff fast enough. And there's so many projects going on at one time. It's, I, I really have to step away from it and get with my family and do normal things just to keep my sanity. So that's when I decided... I'm just going to take some time off. And I hitchhiked across the United States. I didn't know where I was going. I was just a leaf in the wind. I went about 125 miles in about three and a half days and just lived on the river and was just trying to find myself. And to come back here 
I had to get all that behind me get, and then focus on the business. There were some people that owned Natural Bridge at the time, the Puglisi family. And they came up to me and they said, well, you don't have a place. We'd like to talk to you about maybe the possibility of building some kind of attraction down here. Now, the whole face of tourism was starting to really change, especially at places like Natural Bridge. Natural Bridge, Natural Chimneys, and all these places, this, these were places that you went back in the 50s and 60s when you did roadside things. But then there are places like King's Dominion and Bush Gardens that popped up, and they were looking for something sort of like that. And I said, well, I said, you have an old mansion up here in the woods. Why don't we turn that into the Monster Museum, the new one? And they loved the idea of it. I started doing trade shows and meeting other people from other countries. And I realized that there weren't a whole lot of people doing the fiberglass work, which is primarily what I do. I mean, there, there's people out there doing it, but not that many. But by now, I had money and I had a, a way to really put this thing together and had connections and I had some people helping. But after the, the sculpting business became so big, but we had a major fire here. The studio burnt down in 2001. As I was watching the place burn down, this was two o'clock in the morning, I walked up to my mailbox. There was a one-way ticket to hell with my name on it. There were all these religious pamphlets in there. There was a picture from me being on the front page of the Rono Times. My eyes burned out and there was a letter. It said, Hellfire and Brimstone across the top. It said, In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, we have found a slick upon the face of God. It is you, Mr. Mark Klein, because you continue worshiping Satan and practicing ceremonial witchcraft through all your attractions and all the stuff that you build. And the last sentence said, God uses fire as his judgment. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. So I was persecuted by these people that believing, no matter how many charities that I've helped out. These people see this wicked stuff, this de devil stuff. So after that happened, I was without my studio, without an attraction. Well, the dinosaurs remained. So we put the, uh, we put the dinosaurs in, in hibernation, okay, for a while. And it, it, it was very small, one acre, um, but it was so, it was so popular. Um, so I waited for an opportunity to present itself. We tried to sell them. Um, uh, but we kept on to them for a while, and then this opportunity for the property across from the zoo came available. And so we, uh, we worked out a deal with the owner and of the property. With the haunted house being gone, uh, th there, was, there was a lot of people that missed that. So we actually did put a new section into Dinosaur Kingdom 2, which is a little bit of a haunted section. It's called the Dino Dungeon. So there's something for everybody. And so, yeah. It's, um, I'm 62 years old now, and I don't have any lack of work at all. I've got more work than I could possibly handle the rest of my life. The hardest part now is choosing what I want to take on. It's getting ready to jump out at you. You ready? Uh, Here we go. Yeah. All these are, are just different magazines and books that I've been in. Here's one there. He lost the use of his arms and legs. So we created a parade in the smallest town in Rockbridge County. It has 350 residents there. But we called it the greatest uh, Goshen parade ever. In fact, it was turned out to be the biggest parade ever in Rockbridge County. We had 117 entries. Now here I am in the fourth grade 
and I have a ventriloquist dummy. And I'm there, and I did this in my fourth grade class. In fact, about two months ago, I took my fourth grade teacher out. Finally gave her that apple. And when I took her out to lunch, I brought the dummy with me. It was like a little reunion. There, there's the there's the thing of the of the value. The value is like we get paid with checks or money, and we have to use we have to have that to live with. We have to live, but but how much do we actually need? When I have this philosophy that I tell you and I tell people that we really don't own anything, we have to see what we really need in our lives. Uh, what really brings us happiness? Ultimately, it's not the money. The thing that brings all people true happiness, and I'm speaking for myself when I say all people, uh, I'm including this as uh, when I do my ghost tour, I ask this question. I say, I say, what is more important than helping other people? And, and I said, does anybody have a better answer than that? And nobody does. I don't know if they have, if they have one or not speaking up, but I can't think of anything more important than, than healing and helping other people. Now, maybe not everybody has that talent to do it, and maybe everybody doesn't know how to do it, but it brings happiness to help others. Uh, I guess some people are born without empathy. Some people don't understand it. Some people don't get it. But I think they understand the premise, at least. Yeah, well, this is what sort of happens with people like me. Um, I've got two daughters. They're not going to take over the business. So what happens? I've run into several people that have businesses that have been in their family for generations, and then the kids don't want to take it over. What do you do? You sell the business. In my case, it, uh, I may give it a few more years, maybe until I'm about 70, 71, 72, we'll, we'll see. Then I'll start looking to sell it. I'll sell the business and then perhaps I can work for it for a few more years. Because if I don't, what's going to happen? Well, it might just fold up or somebody might buy the property and it might be turned into a bunch of apartment complexes. And I, would like to, I would like to see it continue because it's a part of immortality. Just to know that something of me will survive, it, it's just, it's, just it, it's, it's a good feeling for me. And I like to see the same thing at the park. But again, after I'm gone, it doesn't really matter. What really matters is, to me anyway, is what people might look back and say, well, this is what this guy did, and he was a good guy, and, you know, he, he made a difference, and he really entertained us, and he brought some families together. One time, NPR asked me a question. They said, how would you like to be remembered? Three words. How would you like to be remembered? Give me those three words. And my answer was, a good man. They want, to, they want to start off big in Greenwich Village. They don't, want to, they don't want to go to these art shows on the boardwalk and have their paintings down there. If you don't sell that painting, you're not going to get enough gas money to get back on, this kind of thing. They don't want it to have to go suffer through a lot. They want to start on top. But you need that to, to create the character that you will become. You need to learn how to deal with the failures. If you start off on top, you, you've already, where do you go from there? The adventure is, and I know it's very cliche-ish, is the journey. But when I went through my depression, I looked back over the years and I, I was on the verge of suicide. And this was when I thought, oh, why haven't I made it big and all this? But when I look back now, I'm thinking like, wow, that was a gift. That was great that I went through that. That made me who I am now. I had some hard times. I lost the first wife 
over all this. I, I had a major fire. I, I, I almost went bankrupt several times. It's okay to change the program every now and again. It's, it's okay because it's going to change anyway. What you think about how it's supposed to be here, it's not going to be. The, it's not going to be like this. You're going to start here. It's not going to be like this. It's going to be different. It might be better, and it might be a lot better than it was for me. But I believed in who I was. I believed in my work. I, I rose above the depression. I changed my attitude. I realized that we don't own anything, and ultimately. You have to be a good person, be a generous person, be genuine, and help other people. You start doing this, things start coming to you. They start coming to you. And then, then all of a sudden, they, they're starting to come in abundance. And it gets to the point where you've got, your cup does runneth over. Because you just have to keep the faith. You have to have confidence in who you are and what your work and you might not you might not be rich in money I'm not I mean I go through a lot of it but I but I'm rich in my experiences and I'm able to make a living off of it and I don't care about the fame and I don't care about the money and ironically I've got them both Mr. Slime say something come on come on you need to say something now at least a grunt a, a gurgle, something. You don't say much. All right, be that way. <laughs>